Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None except. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I'll transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are chock full of that, man. That's right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Just don't go set so. If you're going to blitz, come strong, but don't come at all. Coming strong with a Big 12 Media Days recap edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns 24-7. I'm Jeff Howe. Let me bring in the rest of the team. He is the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, Matt Butler. How are you, sir? Pretty well. How about yourself? I'm wonderful. And lifetime Longhorn, 2002 UT All-America, 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award. Fourth round draft choice of the New York Giants in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the CFL. When he was done with football, got himself back to Austin, Texas, and the 40 Acres, where he earned his degree. Whenever that T-ring comes in, he will wear it proudly. Nevertheless, he is a card-carrying member of DBU, and when you get that All-American honor, you're a black card member. Number 21 in your program, number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. Thank you, good man. And good a special uh, happy return to the podcast to Travis Crum, the best damn videographer in the podcast game, Travis. Amen. Travis is uh, busy over there no. doing whatever it is he does. So uh, thank you, Travis, for all your contributions. And no doubt. Guys, let's go ahead and get to it. We're, we didn't touch a lot because uh, we had our Q&A episode last week. And, again, thank you guys so much, everybody that submitted that questions to that. And we've yeah, got some, fun. and we'll get to those at some point. But we didn't really get to any of the all Big 12 stuff because I was worried that it was going to be not quite as topical uh, last week because yeah. some of that stuff was slow to trickle out. But we had media days. The preseason media poll is out in the conference. The all Big 12 preseason team is out. So here's what we got. Texas. Number two in the preseason poll, Sam Ellinger is your preseason offensive player of the year. We've got Sam Ellinger. Uh, who else? Zach Shackelford. Cameron Dicker, Caden Stearns are your four preseason all Big yeah. 12 picks uh, by media members who cover the league. I also had a vote in that, uh, and you, I, did, I did fill out my ballot Who do you year. vote differently than uh, like for a Longhorn players that should have been on well, the all preseason team. Here's the deal: like the Big Twelve is, and and if Andrew Beck or Alex Delatore, two guys I have a lot of respect for, if you listen to this, please take no offense. <laughs> Why there's a fullback spot on the all Big Twelve preseason hey, ballot? I have no idea. Andrew Beck got some love, baby. That's it's like, old school. But I think it for preseason, make it an all purpose or a flex or something. It should be other a than flex. Fullback, considering yeah. the Big Twelve, it should be a flex. So I actually voted Colin Johnson in the fullback spot. Like in protest because I felt nice. It, it I should, like that. It should have been like a flex. Great position. point. Yes. I like that. So it's yeah, because only three wide receivers, right? But there, yeah, and there's three yeah. running backs, and I'm like, I don't think there's three running backs in this league that are worthy. Like the Puka Williams thing, I didn't know how that was going to shake out at the time I filled out my ballot. Yeah, I'm with you. On and, that. The, and then the Kennedy Brooks situation on top of that. So I'm yeah, like, I'm with you. Really, it's like Chuba Hubbard and maybe it should a wild change card? year to year, almost based on. Kind of, and you're right. They should give the media two options as flexes, and then it changes year to year whether we're gonna have three running backs or two or four wide receivers this year. Because last year was one of, probably one of those years. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like this depending becomes on a big debate. What like, kind of talent you have? On right? defense, you can do the same thing, Rob, because there's yeah. so many multiple defenses I now. Agree with this. You can have like a flex spot for a yeah. a de slash outside linebacker for a hybrid guy, and then you can maybe even have a hybrid DB. In yeah, there. it's I don't antiquated. Know, multiple ways. It's to all, but you know what? The NFL is like that. The franchise tag is like that, right? The, oh yeah. That's yeah. what Devian Clowney's arguing about right linebacker. now because they yeah they designated him as a D, as a as a linebacker. So he makes like I don't know one point six or one point seven million less than he would make if they designinated him as a defensive end, which is basically a pass rusher. Right. So they're antiquated too, you know what I mean? So and that's why Le'Veon Bell wanted to be a wide receiver. A wide receiver. He had Jimmy the Graham numbers. wanted to be a wide receiver. And he was a tight end. Right now, the best, a great example is one in the NBA because you have your All NBA teams, and these All NBA teams give you Good eligibility point. for super max deals, which is absurd, and they need yeah. to take out. But you're talking about forty, fifty million dollars difference and you don't have true centers anymore and Great you point. always vote in a center two forwards two guards just put bigs and guards you know yeah. if you're gonna go no i agree or wings. That. that's a great point so i voted colin johnson in the fullback spot in protest 
Uh, Smart. I, I had I had Malcolm Roach as a defensive line pick because I was down between Malcolm Roach and Ross Blacklock from TCU. And no disrespect mm-hmm. to Ross Blacklock as a player, but I think we've talked about this. I know I've talked about it on some of the filling shows I've done on the horn lately. Like, you always worry about anybody coming off an Achilles injury, but uh, a big guy coming off an Achilles, yeah. like, what is that going to look like? And I believe that Ross Blacklock at 80 85% is better than – pretty much any of the other defensive tackles in the league, but is Ross Blacklock going to be 80-85% of what he was before the Achilles? Yeah, you like, don't know. I, I just don't know. So I put Malcolm Roach in there, um, and then I voted Brandon Jones and Caden Stearns in the, I in the second I was going to say, yeah, I put Brandon Jones probably is getting disrespected. Maybe it's good for him. Yeah. I needed the chip on his shoulder. I think Brandon Jones and Colin Johnson. I go back to this with Colin Johnson, Rod. Like last year he wasn't even like an honorable mention all Big 12 no. wide receiver. Yeah, no, I agree. He well, he was overshadowed obviously by Lil' Jordan Humphrey. And yeah, last year the man, the plethora of receivers mm-hmm. in the Big Twelve. It was absurd, man. Mm-hmm. I mean the the stats oh, yeah, for the receivers in the Big Twelve, yeah. it was absurd. So I just think it was just a perfect storm of circumstances for Colin Johnson. This year he'll have his breakout. Poll. So we've got Texas second in the preseason media poll as well. Rod, did you do a ballot this year? No, I don't do that stuff. Because then I'm officially a member of the media and I don't want to be that. I like uh, it. I got you. Y'all, y'all are taking good stances all yeah. over. <laughs> I want to be a fisher. People are yelling, Jeff Howes a moron. He don't know Colin Johnson's not a fullback. <laughs> well, I did it, it, did it in well, protest. The internet, you're going to get some good ones for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I start worrying about what other people think and if I start giving a rat's ass about that, Keep that's it going, man. To get out of get out of the business. You got to stand for something. Right, or you'll fall for everything. There you go. Um, tipping moment. But, uh, no, so, tech. I voted Texas second, and but Rod, right. unlike previous years, my confidence in picking Oklahoma preseason number one, and what I try to do to a certain extent, and there's my ballot has no rhyme or reason to it. For the most part, I try to stick with okay, what do I think the other scribes and talking heads who cover this league, how are they going to think? And I try to kind of follow that logic. Mm, okay. But then there's sometimes, like with the fullback spot, I'm just going to be in protest. Or like newcomer of the year, I know Jalen Hurts is going to win. So yeah. I, my, my vote went to Spencer Sanders from Oklahoma State just okay. because I wanted to go against the grain, and my vote wouldn't matter anyway. Yeah. So I feel you on that. That's what I did with that. Yeah. But Texas second, I, I normally, and I've said this for years now, I'll pick Oklahoma number one because half that's a kind of a coin flip whether you're going to be right or not. It's really not a bad pick. Yeah. Rod, I don't have as much confidence in that Oklahoma pick this year as I have in previous years. Um. I I would have picked Texas this year, but Oklahoma deserves the benefit of the doubt. I, well, out of the 23 years, well, I hope the Big 12 been around 23 years or so. It, I think they've won 12 Big 12 titles with eight different quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that's that's unbelievable, though. You can't even. I mean, and that and the two back to back Heisman Trophy winning number one overall picks. Yeah, man, they deserve it. So yeah, I I know you may have felt a little um, uneasy about it. But, dude, that's the, it's probably one of the safest picks you can make in college football year after year, that no yeah. matter who the quarterback is for Oklahoma, now if they change coaches and keep it going, too, with Lincoln Riley, I know they'll win the Big 12. I you think know. what's clearly been established, though, in the way you look at the preseason media poll shook out, there were only two. Now, Oklahoma, I expected the gap to be not as significant between Oklahoma and Texas. But yeah, clearly, that, was, that was shocking. But clearly – Everybody's thinking, okay, it's clearly Texas and Oklahoma and then everybody else in the league. And, and, and they lost a lot, too. On offense, but I think Lincoln Riley has that much. He has that much gravitas around him. He has that much of an aura now Mm -hmm. that he is that much of an offensive genius that no matter who, as long as he has competent pieces, he will put together a prolific offense. You know what I mean? So I think that he just, and maybe that's more confidence than the world has in Todd Orlando because Texas has basically kind of the similar losses on the defensive side of the ball. Everybody in this league has flaws, right? Even like you look at like Iowa State's third, and I'm like, okay. It's, is it going to be that easy for them to replace David Montgomery and Hakeem Butler? You're talking about two, the two best skilled players, arguably, in the history of Iowa State football. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you, you assume the quarterback <laughs> play, <laughs> but sometimes you don't realize that when the goods around the quarterback go down, sometimes the quarterback can't be as, you know, prolific as he yeah. was the year before. And, I mean, you got a great quarterback there, but I think there's a little bit of stability with that coaching staff, just seeing what they've done lately. But it's a great question to put out there because because they might not be as talented. Love slash for team. Matt Campbell, though, I think. is Right, uh, people, that's part of know? it. Um, exactly. I had I had Baylor at third, and Rob, we were talking about Matt Rule before we Man. started recording. Love me uh, he's Rule. an impressive guy. Yeah, he and is. 
why the NFL likes him. <laughs> and with Baylor, you just wonder, okay, you see them, they were 1-11 basically when you had tore it down to build it back up, seven wins last year. You just wonder, okay, is this the year where playing a bunch of freshmen and sophomores his first two years for Matt Rule is going to pay off, or is that more – Next year, when you got another year with Charlie Brewer as your starting quarterback, and yada yada yada, you're more experienced in other places, yeah. what have you. I don't know, but he, I mean, I, I think you could take Baylor, TCU, Iowa State, Oklahoma State, and rank them anywhere three through six. Yeah. If you're saying what's your Big Twelve pecking order, and you can make an argument that'll make me be like, okay, I can see that. No, Matt, I love Matt Rule. When he was at Temple, man, he was developing NFL talent at kind of the same rate, if not better, than Texas was. <laughs> during a time span there. And, of course, he was doing it with guys that were two-star and had no stars and stuff like that. It's, he is a really, really great talent evaluator, probably even better at developing talent and maximizing that talent. And this is a guy that's coached on both sides of the football, offense, mm-hmm. defense. I think the only positions he hasn't coached are wide receiver and DB, if I'm not – and make quarterback, if I'm not right. mistaken. It, it sounds like a, a sort of a Belichickian prototype it is. when you talk yes. about a guy like that because you're explaining him at first is almost exactly what you want if you're in the NFL, if you were able to you know, go out and actually have a coach unified with the front office and be able to see everything if you can assess and identify and then develop and then understand already because you're the coach what yeah. you want to do with them. That's sort of that streamlined process that the NFL teams would just envy. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know. And, and again, you know, we'll talk recruiting. Uh, Mike Roach will join us later, and, and Mike and I will chop it up on recruiting. And I don't know if this is something we'll get into this week because there's a lot going on recruiting wise. But I think it's one of those deals where you know, if you're Baylor and Matt Rule did this at Temple, uh, you can get away with kind of recruiting tools more so than ball players. Exactly right. Uh, and that's you what can he go, does. You can yeah. go recruit speed and athleticism yep. and projectables and say, okay, in our offense or in our defense at this position. This stuff's going to project well, and we feel like we can develop them. Where at a Penn State or a Texas, you're kind of forced to, hey, we got to go get kids that are highly ranked, and we got to get the kids that are best in our area or our state. You start rolling the dice on guys, and and, or else your fan base is going to be like, what the hell? Why are we not beating? If you're Penn State, why are we not beating Ohio State or Michigan in recruiting? And if it's Texas, why are we not beating Oklahoma or A and M? That's a great point. But to to Baylor and TCU, this is Gary Patterson. He basically is a Gary Patterson recipe as well. Yeah. It, my, my, that fan base doesn't give a damn about the recruiting rank. So they don't care as much about it. If you get highly ranked and great, but usually they're in the twenties and the thirties. It's right. no big deal. You're not gonna you're not gonna be mad if you get Jalen Rager or Ross Blacklock. Exactly. You know, you know and, what I mean? You do get those guys. Element yeah. that's being added. Like think if you're a guy like Matt Rule doing it the way he's done it and there's never been this additional storyline that's added that if you go to a big school now your assessment got you here yet whenever you're there and you're assessing everybody else is now critiquing in a way like why aren't you doing what what we think you should be doing when he's like hey man i got here doing it because i can identify and i can do it my way and that's where sometimes you'll see that conflict between coaches or in, in recruiting overall or just the idea and sometimes it's valid criticism sometimes the coach is right it's just a different element that when you get to that higher level of college football previous coaches never even had to encounter yeah if i had to pick one team that will finish higher than they are uh projected in that poll mm-hmm. it'd probably be baylor yeah because i think they were sixth i think they're like sixth. sixth if i had to pick one team that would finish higher than that it'd be baylor yeah. i think texas is going to win the conference but hell oklahoma could easily win the conference so right you mm-hmm. say texas is going to win the conference and i knew we were Gonna hear it, and people are well. Texas is gonna live up to the hype. Is Texas gonna? Is Texas is gonna Texas live up to back? Hype? Yeah. And you hear that from like national media and regional media that mm-hmm. cover the conference, and they yeah. talk about well, Texas is always overhyped. Well, actually, no, they're really not because mm-hmm. I went back and looked at the history of the preseason media poll from 2011, the year, the first year that the mm-hmm. league went to ten teams. So we could you could rank them one to ten because before then it was all in divisional formats. Yeah. Texas in the preseason poll from 11 through 18, fifth. Third, fourth, fourth, fifth, fifth, fourth, fourth, the last eight years. Where did Texas finish in those years? Sixth, third, fourth, sixth, seventh, seventh, fourth, and second. Okay. So <laughs> from Mac Brown <laughs> and Charlie Strong, at at worst, you're within two spots of your preseason rank. Easily. So actually, as much as the media complains about Texas being overhyped, no, you haven't hyped them that much, and they've finished – Pretty much right where you thought they would. Well, yeah, exactly. They are who we thought they were. Well, yeah. it's like basically <laughs> until you put the like numbers on the table. Because at first, you're like, oh, Texas, they're big and bad. He's like, but I don't think they're right. good this year. But I'm going to say they're overhyped because they're Texas and should be big and bad. 
Furthermore, yeah, Rod, right. dis- and, and I'll read from my column that I wrote on the site that was posted Tuesday morning. I'll tweet this out. Uh, despite the constant claims of Texas being overhyped, Texas has been ranked in the preseason edition of the AP Top 25 only four times in the last eight seasons, never higher than 15th. Uh, and in the four years they've been ranked, they've finished in the poll twice. So <laughs> even nationally, it's like they viewed Texas for the last eight years as kind of a fringe top 25 team, maybe. Yeah. You can get in the top 15, and that's kind of pretty much how Texas is, is gone. Because I, I, I don't think it's Texas is back yet. Um, and even it reminds Tom, me of 90s Texas. Um, even Tom Harmon was talking about this. I, I believe that the media likes – or believes in Tom Herman and him as a program builder, as a young program builder, and they believe in Sam Ellinger. Sam Ellinger was why he was the offensive or uh, projected or picked to be the Pre-season offensive player offensive of the player year. year. It's uh, and, and matter of fact, uh, Vy and Colt were not picked to be uh, off offensive players of the year in the Big Twelve in the preseason. Neither one of them. Oh. Actually, I wonder who was. You know I guess mean? Peterson in 05. Uh, it was Peterson. I don't think you know, like Brad Sam Bradford. Sproles and Bradford and, yeah. and some other ones. Um, so I think that's why there's there's a difference, right? Because Texas being back means that's that's Mac Brown, you know, two thousand two to to two thousand nine. That's you know mm-hmm. ten guaranteed wins. Who's the next great quarterback coming? It's a it's a pipeline and the system's rolling. You know that's what Clemson's at right now. Ohio State, hell, I don't know if Ohio State ever ever leaves that <laughs> kind of that 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 you know that kind of uh, consistency. I mean they've been. I can't think of a down year for Ohio State in a long time. Anyway, that interim year, that's it. And I think John Cooper's last year. I think they were like six and six. Or Trestle's first year. I think they were like yeah. Six. You got to go way way back. Yeah, you got to you got to go back. But my my point being, once you get it rolling at a at a blue blood. It, it's so much momentum. Once you get it rolling, man, it's hard to stop it. You're going to go for at least a couple of years. I mm-hmm. mean, even like the Florida States, I mean, when Jimbo hit his run, there and there are issues. Trust me, now we learn like, oh, man, they had a lot of issues. And now even we all know that Texas, toward the end of that run from like, Oh seven through oh nine, man. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of issues, yes. but you just had so you had transcendent talents like uh, Jimbo had Jameis Winston, and mm-hmm. you had your co- your Colt McCord, and it's like, no, that guy is so good. All those issues you have, all of those fractures within the blueprint, they don't even really matter. And will yeah. will Muschamp change in the culture defensively? You know what I mean? You yeah. got yeah, so you have things that don't make up for that. So Texas isn't there yet. I think right. they'll get there one point. Clemson's there right now. Like Clemson's just it rolling. Next quarterback Deshaun Watson, Trevor Lawrence. Like just boom, keep it rolling. Bama's there. You know what I mean? Ohio State's there. Right. And a lot of schools are gonna be there at the same time, but I think Texas is getting to that point. And that's what the that's why the recruiting thing is so big. I'm mm-hmm. glad you you went there, Rod. So let's start there. So I wrote a column based off off something Tom Herman said, which of everything he said, uh, and I haven't listened to everything from the breakout session yet. But basically, when he was on the dais in his formal press conference, something that through the first two years we would never hear him say, and I don't know that's getting as much play as it probably should. When he said talked about building a program, when he said they're actually a little bit ahead of schedule, yeah. That's number one. Tom Herman coming off is really confident, but number two, I think to your point, when you're at a blue blood, like it shouldn't take you that long to figure out whether you've got the right guy or not. And you start looking at at some of the stuff Tom Herman's done. Um, I'm just gonna run down. Just again, this is a column I wrote. Uh, so Tom Herman's got a uh, 6.29 winning percentage. It's not as good as Mac Brown's through his first two years, but it's better than Daryl Royal. Uh, Tom Herman and Blair Cherry are the only two Texas head coaches in the poll era to win their first two bowl games. Uh, And Herman, Royal, Mack Brown, Blair Cherry, uh, Ed Price, and Fred Akers uh, are the only coaches in the poll era to lead Texas to a bowl currently in the New Year's Six structure within their first two years. So everything's pointing in that direction. And Tom Herman can also be the first head coach, Texas head coach, along with Mack Brown in the poll era, to have your first double-digit win season and follow it up the next year with your second double-digit win season. So, I mean, if Texas, even if they get to 10 wins this year, I mean, that tells you they're, they're heading in the right direction. And, Rod, mm-hmm. to your point, when you can tell it's really rolling, you look at, uh, gosh dang it, I just had the numbers in front of me, uh, what Mack Brown did in that run from, oh, yeah, from 2001 through 2009. Yeah. This, I don't, it's unbelievable. Uh, again, the end was really bad, but you can still appreciate the good part. Yeah. For those eight years or nine years, whatever it was, Best era of Texas football ever. A 101 and 16 record, two Big 12 titles, four BCS appearances, a national title, and a national title game appearance. And it was amazing, honestly, even more amazing. 
because and, and we all know this because it was so intimate to us. We were we were there in the moment. Texas underachieved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because Bob freaking Stoops there at Oklahoma speaking of programs that'll like, keep it rolling. Yeah. Right? Just literally those moving. first four years were negated. Yeah, like, one it, through four. It, Texas ultimately underachieved. That was greatness, but hell, it should have been what they had sixteen losses in that span. It should have been more like twelve and a, a few more wins versus Oklahoma mm-hmm. or one of those wins in the Big Twelve title game versus Colorado. Yeah. And he should have had he should have played for he played for two national titles. Probably should have played for three, you can make three the argument. Four. You can make the oh, argument. Eight is fair you know to give him a. I know. Oh, eight, I, I know. We should have played for yes. one during my time. Oh one and oh eight, you give him because I and I wrote you know this I mean? on the yep. message board because people were complaining about Mac and oh, they said, eight. well, he didn't oh, achieve God. enough. I said you can make that argument, but if Chris Sims doesn't melt down against Colorado oh, and if the BCS gets it right in oh eight. He's got 12. Mac has two more Big 12 titles, and he's playing for two more national titles. I was going to say he plays for two more national titles. Because 08 was. Who knows about 08? Because that team was loaded. That team was so good. I don't think you guys guys in 01 beat Miami, with all due respect, Rod. Probably not. You deserve to play. But I would have loved to have seen that 08 Texas team against that Florida team. Man, that would have been nasty. That would have been fun to watch. Yeah, that would have been fun to watch. And the 08 one was Think about it. That would have been, that been, a, that been Mac Brown Mac against Charlie, a Charlie Strong Charlie defense. Charlie Strong defense, yeah, you're right. Vance Bedford was the DB's coach. Urban Meyer Florida and team. Mac. Ooh, see? One and that, the that's what we missed that because then Mac would have had a chance to go up against Pete Carroll, Urban Meyer, and, and Nick, Nick Saban. Saban. And he you may have passed the it, torch. It, it, it totally changes his legacy, too, because then you're like, I got something. Now I got something to compare Mac to. No, no, no. Mac beat this guy, this guy. You know what I mean? It's. Oh man, you're so right. He un- ultimately, he underachieved because the rival Oklahoma. Right. They were they were also in their prime too, and they underachieved. Oklahoma fans will tell you. That's the yeah. Thing about it. Oklahoma fans will say, "Oh, Bob Stoops underachieved after he 2000. We didn't get crap. <laughs> he he should have won more national title." And Longhorn fans will say, well, that's, "That's the that's the curse of the blue blood, right? Yeah. You're a prison of your own excellence." Sooner fans are like, "We should have won more yep. national title." Longhorn fans, "We should have won more national titles." You're like, "Well, you played you, you played for two and one one." Like, nah. We should, but th- yeah. it's right, though. It's true when you're that close to it. That's the prison you know? of fandom whenever you sort of are sitting there and you're just viewing it through your own prism. Yeah. And well, Tom Harmon will be there before you know it. They're ahead of schedule. That's the Georgia game. That's what that represents. Well, and think yeah. about the reputation, though. Just b- winning OU game, how huge it is. Because you go 0-4, that oh, 0-1 yeah. through 0-4. No doubt. And basically, that said the temp. Bob right. Stoops had his career. Right. He could do whatever he wanted exactly just because right. of that. And it, it almost got Mac fired. Mac luckily wasn't fired, and there weren't rash decisions made in that yeah. 04 era, and you were able to then have Mac win 4 of 5 from 05 yeah. to 09, Mac, and Mac. that sort of yeah. solidified Mac status sure. forever. And then at that point, those guys sort of became legends at their schools only because they split that time. But, I mean, who knows how crazy it could have went just if one game goes one way at one other time and where the each pr- uh, program goes in what direction. Got to beat your rival, man, yeah. Jim Harbaugh. Learn a lesson. You yeah. got to beat your right. Don't matter what mm-hmm. you do. You don't beat your rival, man. You it's funny. Fed up with you. Quick. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up because when uh, I was filling in for Aaron on 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 B and E one morning uh, when he Except was on when he was on vacation and Bucky and I we were talking about Jim Harbaugh and I was like, yeah, he, he just can't he can't beat Michigan. He can't beat Michigan State or, or Ohio State. No. And no. Uh, we're thinking about it, and I'm like, well, he is three and one against Penn State, and Bucky's like, yeah. And you hear Penn State fans complain about <laughs> yeah, James yeah. Franklin can't beat Michigan. Yeah, yeah you're right. That's exactly right. It was a vicious cycle. Yeah. That's why the one time that was bizarre was when Francione beat Texas and then just said, I'm out, peace, I quit. And yeah, like before, George Costanza, he just leaves <laughs> that on was, the high man, note. Uh, that was amazing. <laughs> the mic drop, leave on the high yeah. note. I feel you, man. No, it's – it is. Uh, it's, that's really interesting, though. You bring that up, and Tom Herman, he knows they're ahead of schedule because of the Georgia game. Because the Georgia game, that's why it was so big. It's one of the biggest wins in the history of Texas football because everybody close to it. We talk about the fans who are close to it. You didn't expect Texas to beat Georgia like that, right? Yeah. We know this Texas team, and we were thinking, okay, little Jordan Humphrey goes off, Colin Johnson goes off, this, 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 this. It was like a blowout in the we OU game, it, and we had it the way it was going. Exactly, it was like one of those Mac Brown blowouts yeah, no, in exactly. his career. Yeah, those two was it two thousand like was it twelve or what did oh, Mac like? Yeah, two thousand twelve was bad. Was, 2011 yeah, you know I mean? 2012 yeah. yeah you know what I mean but um it, it's but it was so it was so big because Texas beat them as you point out the SEC is a line of scrimmage league and Texas dominated Georgia who just went blow for blow with Bama yeah. who might have you know what I mean them and Clemson have the best line of scrimmages in all of college football everybody understands that everybody knows that and yet Texas do- not, 
I mean, I hate to say dominated, but they definitely had their way with Georgia yeah. in that game line scrimmage. And and as you pointed out, Jeff, did it with playing nine to ten defensive linemen. Right. Depending yeah. on how you look at it, depending on how you depend and, on Joseph Asai. And it's worth pointing out, even though I agree fully with you, it was a game that didn't mean as much for Georgia as it does for Texas. So we see in bowl games those type of results. But it still happened. It doesn't matter. But it's just like the same way that you saw, say, Utah annihilate Alabama in 08 right before that. 09. So those but, things but happen that, in bowl games. You Utah was a good program. Yeah, true. It, it, it was. Go, go, go look at Utah's like Texas, bits, right? That's exactly. You, that, that wasn't an indicator. It was. Could have been that Bama wasn't up for it and they didn't uh-huh. want to play. But it really wasn't indicated that Utah wasn't on the rise because after that, Utah t- ends up being one of the better college football programs yep, in the country. For sure. You see that. Yep. You know what I mean? And yep. they still are, actually. They both can align. Yeah. Uh, and to, y- to your point, right about the Georgia game, Kirby Smart, even at SEC Media Days, was talking about the loss of Texas. And ended his thoughts on it with those guys out competed, out physicaled us, and out toughed us. Don't forget out coached you. Yeah, that don't forget too. You, you forgot out coached. He didn't want to admit yeah. that because that's that's on him. But right. you got out coached, man. You got y'all got out coached, and game. that's big. If you have Texas a players, game plan was better, and players that were hungrier and came out and performed, and that's yeah. something that is really big for college football. If you can make sure that your team is playing at least to the level that you expect every week. If you're a team program like Texas, that means you're going to win 10 or 11 games. Well, I think that's why Simon Harmon's confident, too. He outcoached Kirby Smart. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that, that's <laughs> yeah. the, the thing about his confidence. He's like, yeah. man, I outcoached Kirby Smart, man. I, I, you know think, what I mean, that's big for him. I think He's done it before, I, I too, when he was the D.C. of Alabama and Tom Herman was yeah. the O.C. He talked but about – one of the things he talked about was the tangible results kind of helping guys understand, okay – we're on the right path. We're building this the right way. That's the message to the players. But I think for Tom Herman, it kind of kind of validates yourself too that hey, what this coaching staff is doing and preparing this team, uh, that that's going well. But I, I think Rod, the other area where he's confident and kind of where I want to go next is we shift topics from media days, and we talk about Sam Ellinger. I think one of the reasons why Texas had a schedule, I think they knew, they felt they had a good quarterback in Sam Ellinger. I don't think they knew. They had a, I don't think they felt like he was going to be that good that quick last year. No, not after the Maryland game. It, something happened to him. And, you know, Jason Asur has been talking about hmm. the light going off for a while. And um, Ty Dodge, I believe, is another one's been like, no, yeah. no, no, when the light goes off for him, trust me, it'll go off. I remember him saying that his freshman year when he was struggling with turnovers and he wasn't, you know, making good decisions. He was still a freshman, so mm-hmm. we were really hard on him anyway. But. And that Maryland game, I remember I was like, man, he still kind of looks like the guy that, in the Vince. big moments that he's, you know, just making bad decisions. After that, the light went off for him. He started taking care of the football. I believe he still had a turnover versus Tulsa. Had a yeah, fumble. fumble. That, fumble, that right? was a bad one. That was, was a, when that, I was that, still like, yeah. yeah but then yeah. after that, that was everything wasn't, was good. Yeah, that was just him being loose with the football. And I believe he was just trying to scramble or something. Remember he they just didn't that. feel the pr- pressure. Yeah, after, that, they had that drive, though, in the Tulsa game. It was a 13-play, 75-yard drive where – that was the first time all night where since the first drive, and he, really you can't even say the first drive because Caden Stearns got you an interception and you were on a short mm-hmm. field. But that was the first time where it really felt like, hey, this offense actually looks competent. And it I know, reminds me of Vince's yeah. sophomore year I when know, Vince did the same thing and, in 04. And I know it was against Tulsa, but in hindsight being twenty twenty, maybe that's the drive where you look and say, maybe that just gave them confidence to say, hey, when you mash the gas and you know you do what you're told and you follow the plan and you execute it well, yeah, it can look really good. Yeah, no, no, I just I, I think it was Sam's transformation and that was it was it was all for him. It was internal. He was mm-hmm. just he knew that was the biggest. He trust me, this guy pays attention to social yes. media and he's not he's not immune to it. All right, he, he knows the biggest complaint about him was what. Turns the football over, mm-hmm. makes bad decisions with football. He knew that. Biggest complaint about him. And I think that was the one thing he's like, all right, I got to fix that. And you can't really fix that in practice. You know what I mean? Like It's hard, it's right. hard to fix that in practice. No, that's like, all real. You, that's all, that's all you, the, literally, in-game, real-time, making better decisions with the football, better ball placement, all that kind of stuff. And I think he just went – he deliberately decided to, that that was going to be a priority for him, and that's why you get those long drives. Because he's making better decisions right. with football, not only not turning the football over, and we know that, but also just keeping drives alive Content. because of his yes, because of his patience now with the football, because of now his uh, comfort within that offense and with that offense, he's just making better decisions. That's why you get your twelve play drives, yeah, your thirteen play just drives. Just don't f it up. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Right. Don't he understand, but that's a mental that. advancement yeah. in yeah. his mind to understand the wider picture of exactly. the offense. And I don't always have to be the star. I don't always have to save the day. I don't 
don't have to be Captain Save a Play. I well, can, and the alignment. You know, I got, I, and remember, Tom Herman said this too. He said he trusts his teammates more. That's what the, one of the biggest leaps for him has been, and that trust is part of him taking care of the football and making better decisions because he doesn't have to take it all on his shoulders. Yeah. The Sam Ellinger show that no longer has to be the uh, you know the end all be all for this offense. We saw that last year with. Uh, I mean, I talked about one of the reasons why I felt like he gained confidence was the realization that look, when you're dealing with Colin Johnson, Little Jordan Humphrey, you don't have to throw a perfect ball. What? Just throw it in their area yeah, exactly. and let them go get it. So I think Tom Herman's confident because he knows he's got Sam Ellinger for two more years, and that's yeah. part of where I think the ahead of schedule comment comes. But where I think he's confident, Rod, and in talking to the players, I really felt this, I think he's starting to realize the leadership he's got, while it might not be the quantity in terms of numbers like he had last year, Yeah, I think the quality with this group in terms of leadership is off the charts. Brandon Jones, uh, who mm-hmm. Todd Orlando calls the dude and – Tom Herman gave what might be the best compliment another man can give another man, said he's the kind of guy you want to marry your daughter. Uh-huh. I don't have a daughter, but I assume that's pretty, you know, that's a very high, that's a, that's high praise. Off the football field <laughs> style. Yeah, you know what I mean? Person. Uh, he didn't me. say his daughter, but he said yeah. marry your daughter. Well, I don't so, think he has one, does he? Uh, I don't, they have a boy or something. I don't, I don't, know. Know. I don't know. Exactly. Um, Trust me, even when you have a 17-month-old, the wheels turn and you start exactly, thinking 20, right? you start 20 look, 25 years down yeah, the road. Like, yeah. Yeah. Already about, thinking for the future. said it about another young man about, like, no, man, this is the kind of dude you want to marry your daughter. That's high like, praise. Yeah. That's high praise. Uh, and then, you know, you start looking at Colin Johnson and – you know, Colin Johnson's been around for a long time. Hell, I remember when Colin Johnson was being benched by Tom Herman because mm-hmm. the complaint was he wasn't working hard enough in practice, and now he can't say enough great things about Colin Johnson. Uh, Malcolm Roach has been around forever, it seems. Uh, that yeah, guy's great, great leadership. True. And, of course, Sam Ellinger, Tom Herman says, the best leader that he's ever been around. Yeah. There's that's a couple, a lo- now, that's also right. high praise. And all these type of things we're talking about right now about this team off of last year just aligns so much with what, if you go back and remember that 4 year and, and Vince's sophomore year and being the guy that's sort of trying to find himself, the fan base isn't sure, but by the end of the year you're like, oh, my God, we got our guy. And then Jeff talking about how the roster's full of these guys that are leaders. And even if you say yep. you're losing a few players, like when you're talking about Jones, it reminds me of like a Michael Huff of the defense defense like a guy that you have there that is just sort of seen as the leader yet there's talented pieces around him that may have more upside or maybe become things the way that Aaron Ross was a Thorpe Award winner but wasn't even playing he was like the fifth DB on that team if you look at it and that's how the DBs are right now and the way the talents dispersed and then even guys like Roach who had been around for four years it seems like it just when you start to look at that and then see how Texas ended that 0-4 year and how it helped propel and the team sort of grew together very quick sort of the way we talk about that sophomore year of Zeke when Tom Herman was at uh, Ohio Ohio State State. and beat Alabama and beat Kirby Smart's defense at that time too like it's sort of aligns that when you get that young core to have that exponential growth within one calendar year and it just sort of feeds the confidence but then you have the whole offseason so it Mm -hmm. sort of builds the hype and like it was weird going into the 05 year that Texas fans you knew that you were better and it was maybe different than before, but it hadn't proven yet. Yet you weren't very scared because you had the trust in a player like Vince, a leader, a quarterback, and you had a trust in a strong defense. And that's sort of what Texas has right now. There's a few things that <clears throat> stand out to me and what I've heard, what I heard from players in terms of leadership. Uh, talking to Brandon Jones, I asked him, what was the one thing you really learned about yourself while you were recovering from the ankle surgery? And his response was, and Rod, it's simple, but it's simplistically brilliant. He said, I worked on being a vocal leader because I had to. He's like, I didn't have a choice. Yeah. He said he's typically a lead by example guy. He's like, well, you can't lead by example when you're on a scooter, you know, recovering from ankle surgery. He's like, so I, I had to learn how to talk. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm Roach said he did the same thing when he was out with the foot last year. He basically turned himself into a de facto student coach during the season because he said he didn't want to be a distraction or have people feeling sorry for himself. So he took it upon himself to get Jeffrey McCulloch ready and get Taquan Graham ready and get Joseph Osai ready. And I was asking Malcolm Roach about Moro Ojomo, who's a guy that I think we're excited about, who, by the way, doesn't turn 18 until August Pretty as crazy. a redshirt freshman. Yeah. Um, KD and, and, style. and Malcolm made the comment, we we're joking, Malcolm's like, yeah, man, he's shaving and everything. He's got a full beard now, so he's, <laughs> he's growing up. But – Malcolm Roach stopped himself. He's like, yeah, I need to text him back because he called me about some technical stuff, and he's trying to be more of a technician. Like, the young guys are taking it upon themselves to reach out to the old guys like, hey, can you help me with this? Mm-hmm. And Zach Shackelford, mm-hmm. 
that I thought this was awesome because how long have we been talking about this cycle being broken? Mm-hmm. Remember those three weeks Herb Hand was out on vacation when he had the tweet I'm going on vacation? Zach Shackelford said it was basically up to him. If guys wanted to watch film, he, him and Garrett Graff, who's a GA, he's like, it was basically those two organizing film sessions. Like, hey, you want to go watch film? Yeah, I'll go let you in there. I'll show you kind of how to do it. And Zach Shackelford said he's been helping Parker Braun get in the film room to try to get him ready. So, Rod, the fact that you've got guys, and again, it's you don't have a lot of these leaders, but the fact that you've got those guys performing the kind of important functions mm-hmm. we haven't heard about guys doing around here for a long time. Yeah, that's that's when you're starting to get somewhere as a program. Yeah, no, I agree. You gotta uh, when you come in, and I came in with great leadership. I mean, um, in Mac Brown's second year, I mean, we had Casey mm-hmm. Hampton on those teams and D.D. Lewis on those teams. Think about the guys on defense that I came in with. Uh, Mon well, Brooks was a great leader. A freshman leader. Corey Redding was probably freshman a great. Freshman Corey Redding was a great. He really was. <laughs> that he's, dude's like a grown up. always like, the uh, tallest man in the room. No, little in things. That's a great point. He was. He was like an old man river. Dude. If you he ever was. walk in the room with that um, guy, there's no way he's not a leader. Like, right? that's him. Uh, obviously, Major on the offensive side, Kwame Cavill, all those guys. And I remember Kwame Cavill pulling me aside after practice, who is now the coach at Waco. Mm-hmm. Uh, Waco High. Congrats to, to His alma mater. Um and uh, he's he said hey man let's go we gotta I, I need somebody to, to to cover me while I run routes I want to run routes and I'm like all right you know what I mean and what I didn't realize was he was just trying to get me in the habit of no you stay after practice all the time and do something this is your normal this yeah. is the normal thing yeah. Every, you know what I mean all this, this is an all, extra this, this is all what those you guys need to who do. are leaving getting on the bus those are guys who will never be as great as they they never reach their true potential right you know what I mean even if they go to the league they could be better you could be better stay out here and get better and it was just it was little things like that you know what I mean that you that you just kind of picked up on you learned and you learned that from older guys like and if older guys aren't doing that then the younger guy, you don't really learn it. Now, some guys are natural leaders, like say Corey Redding. He probably was going to stay out there anyway. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. um, but you do learn that. And I came down early, so I remember I came down, like, in the spring to work out. Back then, guys didn't have, like, they went early enrollees. Right. So you, like, come down and work out on your own. You have to live with – I lived with Joe Walker and Greg Brown yeah. uh, during that time. You know what I mean? And, you know, they were great leaders, and they, they really were. They kind of just showed me the ropes. And I remember being that young guy, like, hey, man – when uh when when you know, we're running the cover two, so what my what I you mean know, asking questions and I'm mm-hmm. sitting me down like all right man this is what we're gonna do I'm gonna go out and like going in the backyard with you know Joe Walker and that's what I was like and don't like, be afraid to ask yeah you know? and I remember Richard Howtower who now works for the 49ers <laughs> you know what I mean was one, yeah Peanut was, and he was a coach now but he was a coach back then coach he was Peanut. a special teams guy but you know what I mean he still like paid attention to the game that's why he's a coach now to the point where he knew I could ask him questions and he mm-hmm. was an older guy it was. So I remember that environment, man, and I remember yeah. me and I remember looking forward to being that guy for Nasty Nate, yeah, and, just that and football Cedric IQ Huff, on and, those and, and Cedric Griffin and Michael Huff, and, yeah. And to your point, like Texas fans won't remember guys like Joe Walker and Greg Brown. They like won't. That, I those, will. those guys yeah. tend to, to no disrespect to those guys, but yeah. they tend to get forgotten. But the fact that you learned it from those guys, you pass it on to Michael Huff and Cedric Griffin, who then they pass it on to. You know, yeah. Earl Thomas is the world, and it's that, that's how that's go. how that that's cycle. how you get to Earl Thomas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's how that's Earl Thomas, exactly. Thomas starts with you. a Joe Walker saying, "No, you can come live with me, Rod B. Uh, You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. you know where to live. Come live with me. Like, and just and it's hey, we are gonna compete for the same job. You know that, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm gonna show you the ropes because there is a there's a bigger picture. Just like and that's how you end up with Earl Thomas watching your footwork and complimenting you with the best footwork just, in TV. Boom! That's just how like if if, how it circle. if Isaiah Hookfin ends up being a high draft pick, and Zach Shackelford said he was really impressed with Isaiah Hookfin, like of all the young linemen, he yeah, said awesome that, that guy just the way that's he works and name. everything. Um, like but from Harry Potter. But if Isaiah Hookfin ends up being a, a first round pick, you take it back to Zach Shackelford kind of yeah. letting guys in the film room That's and exactly doing right. that. You know, if Keandre Coburn ends up being what we think he could be, it goes back to Chris Nelson reassuring him, like, no, ask me questions, be annoying. That's the only way you're gonna learn exactly is if you right. ask questions. Exactly. That's a great point. I agree you know? with that. 100%. So we might not, you know, ten years from now, it might be us old heads talking about, oh, you're Chris Nelson and Zach Shackelford and guys like that on that twenty eighteen team. Yeah, people won't remember it, but you will because those are the guys that, that they helped get that stuff reignited again. Charles Amena, who's one of those guys, and Charles has some skins on the wall, but yep. you guys get what I'm saying. I mean, it, it starts, it it's, it's a, it's a some point. group has to be the group that picks it back up. Yep. Well, Everett Rawls and, you know, and guys like that ha- recognize what, you know, what, what, you, what Derek Johnson can do. You go, mm-hmm. okay, 
all right, you know what? I'll I'll give whatever I got to that guy because mm-hmm. <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna be great anyway. He's gonna see the field. I ain't stopping that. You right. know what I mean? So, uh, Rod, as we start to wind it down here uh, with Big 12 Media Days, and we'll talk more about this this week, and we got a couple more shows before uh, fall camp starts. Which, by the way, reporting day, August 1st. First practice is August 2nd. Man, beautiful thing. Yeah. So Makes me happy. <laughs> you, you're seeing win totals for Texas, and I'll see if I can pull some of that stuff up. But, you know, we you know, nine and a half is I'll the number that moved. I've seen. The preseason yeah. media projections, all that stuff. Are you feeling, Rod, are you feeling, after Big 12 media days, are you feeling as good about your thoughts on Texas going in, worse or better? Better. And this could just be me drinking the Kool-Aid because I, you know, got just to see the guys and talk to them. But Tom Herman, he's saying all the things that I want to I hear him say. That right? I, didn't, he, I didn't expect him to say. Exactly. He is throwing, and now he, I will say this, he has, he's thrown out random stuff before. Remember the first year he came he did say that that offensive line was as good as his Ohio State offensive line. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> like, uh, I don't Connor know. Williams, and, maybe. But I think, remember that, that year he also said he didn't, he hadn't watched any film of the guys? <laughs> and I believe him now. Like, I, I off believe the him. bus, <laughs> off the hook. These look like some linemen. Yeah, I believe him. <laughs> if, if you are making that comparison, then you have not watched film on these guys at all. So, but I, he talked about the offensive line. He said it's the, it's going it, and without injuries, knock on some wood here. Um, that's what um, he said. It's going to be the best group he's had since he's been here. He, he's confident that it will be the best group without the injuries. He's talking so much about Jordan Whittington. Dude, at this point, the last time somebody in within this regime, they talked this much about a f- true freshman, it was Caden Stearns. That's awesome. Right? I remember all the talk about Caden Stearns. I was like, man, so he's unbelievable. The he's only time. The only time. Hell, he was starting. He started like the first reps of the spring mm-hmm. or something like that. He like, started the spring game as I don't he know how been that, in high school. <laughs> How do you even earn the job? You walk in. You he don't earn it. You're better than everybody the second you walk, walk in the door. In, was, as they walk in. I, when was the last time it happened? So I was a walk-in starter at any position. Hell, even Roy Williams, I think. I, I got to go back and look and see if he walk He might be the one in the last Hell, walk-in Hell, Rick Barnes starters. said that KD had to earn a spot when he got to <laughs> Texas. KD starters, exactly. I, man, hell, Colin Murray, uh, even Lincoln Rose, like, now nah, you got to earn this spot. Yeah. Yeah, hell, no, the Aggies didn't even play him. Not Caden Stearns. Uh, anyway, the, but that, that's the last time I heard somebody talk about a player that and put heap expectations on that player as much, especially on a true freshman, as much as Jordan Whittington is right now. Yep. And if people so. have been waiting to uh, bet the over mm-hmm. or the over nine and a half, it's still going in half. the favor. If you are going to bet the over, it's paying better, which means the big money is going on the under. Because la- you remember it was at even two weeks ago. Then it was at plus 115. Now it's at plus 125. So you get 1.25 the amount of money you bet if you think Texas mm-hmm. will go over. Now the under, it was at about minus 130. Then it was 145 last week. Now it's at 155. So if you're betting the under, you'd have to bet 155 just to win 100. So Vegas is really starting to make me think that Texas may go under, but if you really like that bet, the bet's just getting better for Texas's favor if you're betting the over. The uh, one other thing I like that Tom Herman said, uh, he said Keontae Ingram has put on 15 to 20 pounds of armor, as he calls it. Right. So those things, the Jordan Whittington thing, comment, the comment, of, and he also talked about Cade Brewer a lot. He was like, because they questioned him about Andrew Beck, and was like, hey man, Andrew Beck's gone. You know, what are you going to do about tight end? Can I throw in another one about true freshmen? Go ahead. I'm starting to think this Jake Smith hype is real. He's another one. Been they've hearing been hearing a lot. You haven't heard as much about him because he wasn't here for the spring game because Jordan yeah. Winters has been here longer. But, yeah, I've heard he's a freakish athlete. Like, you know what? And I, I know this. the, the word the, at a media day is the phrase told me gets thrown around kind of loosely. But yeah. by the end of Sam Ellinger's media session is when I went over there when there was like two people around him. Um, and I asked him about Jake Smith. They said it was like the fourth time, so maybe he told this to somebody else. I don't know, but I asked him about Jake Smith, and Sam Ellinger's quote to me was, he's raw as a route runner. He doesn't even really know what he's doing, and he's still in seven-on-seven. Seven, <laughs> he's still getting five- or six-yard separation because he's just that dynamic that as an dynamic. athlete. Man, yeah. that's amazingly huge. Yeah. That's what Texas has been yeah. envying, those type of freak players that you've seen across the Big 12 like over the years. Like there's been – I mean, it seems like every year Oklahoma State has a new version of somebody Oklahoma that looks as Oklahoma has had a couple of those exactly. guys. West Virginia has had a couple of those guys. Yeah, Baylor's, had those guys. Guys. <laughs> Baylor's had a couple yes, of those exactly. guys. It's yeah. yeah. been a while since Texas had a couple of those guys. Trevante Turbin at TCU is one of those he guys. Is what, TCU has like – yeah, they've been having – Vincent Marquise Goodwin. 
point. Yeah, on the download, they've had a ton of the fastest Pretty guys. Pretty much everybody play. in the league but Texas. Yeah, really. since Marquise Goodwin. Marquise really. Goodwin was the last DeJay, one. DJ, but he really. But for Marquise to, to get the ball, it had to be on the right hash mark. Oh, yeah, certain guys always say that had certain guys on, moved the, the right chains and certain guys changed the game. Jake Smith sounds like. And then think about these are all the questions we have, right? It's like, who's going to play the H receiver role or the H uh, back role or whatever it is? And. How about the running game, and what about the offensive line? We know wide receiver is going to be good. We know the quarterback's going to be good. So right now, tight end is also something that he was championing. He's championing Cade Brewer as a guy that can be that versatile piece that Andrew Beck was. I think there are answers to all the questions on offense that I there have. There are, yeah. You know what I mean? No, and they're, I'm not, they're not always the best answers. Right. I don't know if they're right answers but th- either, but think, think about answers. Think about it from this standpoint, though, Rod. Some of the guys we talked about, if Jake Smith, Jordan Whittington, and Parker Braun by the time you get, let's say by the time you get to the Oklahoma game, if those three guys are as good as we've heard they probably can be, yeah, then that solves really the three biggest question marks you had on offense. Totally agree. Because if you move Cosme over to left tackle between Cosme, Braun, and Shackelford, three-fifths of your offensive line should be pretty good. I agree with that. Yep, left side's going to be nice. And you know Derek Kerstetter's going to plug in somewhere and be solid. Yep. And you guys, yeah, and you guys, Shaq, so all you need is that right tackle spot and then a couple other guys. No, I'm not saying trust. they're going to be like the Art Shell, Gene Upshaw, Oakland Raiders offensive line, but. But you, but your backfield is now more explosive. Right, exactly. And they're going to be better, so that should add up to a better product running the football. What, it, what explosive, play, what explosive, having explosive playmakers does. And we saw Texas get by last year with mm-hmm. te- the Texas explosive plays. It wasn't obviously the 50 yard bombs because Texas was, I think, well, them and Rutgers, I think, were the only two. That yeah, didn't have mm-hmm. a play of 50 right yards. That, yep. The explosive plays, but if you start looking at things like pro football focus when they break the metrics down, like Lil Jordan Humphrey had more explosive plays technically than I think any receiver in the Big 12 last yes, year, except yeah. for Hollywood Brown maybe, or maybe they were one too. No, I think he did. Because yeah. a lot of the yeah, Texas yeah. explosive plays, they're the like the 18 to 25 yarders. Yes. Yeah. They're not the, the 40 pluses. That goes for touchdowns. Right. Yeah. And, but what. Uh, a, a better version of Keonta Ingram uh-huh. give you and Jordan Whittington gives you and Jake Smith gives you and even Duvernay if you can start hitting on some of those shots, it increases your margin for error. Yep. Yes. And another thing to point out since you brought up that stat, when you have a really good defense and win field of position, you have less opportunities for 50-plus plays. So your 36-yard touchdown, if a guy breaks it, it would have been a 50-yarder if you were that far back. But if you have good field position, you don't even have the yeah. opportunity for <laughs> those type of plays. Like that bomb Ellinger hit Duvernay with in the West Virginia game, yeah. that thing's scoring from 80. Like It, yes, doesn't, it, it doesn't was 48, matter. but it, yeah. it doesn't matter where it would have been from. the defense let you go and it made it only be a 46-yard play or whatever, that's how those lie in and then if you're talking explosives the way you brought up just the offensive line how big that is is because we've been just hoping for average play the last few years and we finally seem to maybe get it last year at that level and if you can get average it allows your stars to be basically your offense is as good as your stars can be and if you can ever get above average play to where you're actually now opening stuff up for these guys that's when it can get really fun to watch and you got those guys that can take a eight yard run and turn it into a 18 or 20 yard yes, run. Yes, exactly. All right, we'll pick this back up next week, but right now let's go ahead and talk some recruiting with Mike Roach. All right, well, you know, I don't I can't promise that we'll have a commitment to talk about every week that uh we record this segment of the show, but uh so far we're actually can you be 3 for 2? I don't know. Three commitments, two shows. Uh Without further ado, Mike Roach, Horns 24/7 recruiting editor. Mike, uh the Vernon Broughton commitment we, this was uh, he was supposed to make his announcement like seventy five different times in the previous four days, but uh, it happens on Wednesday. And uh, first off, man, uh, I just want to thank everybody for the feedback on you know Mike joining the Blitz and Mike. I know you got some good feedback, man. This is uh, this is a good deal, I think, for everybody involved. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think maybe uh, maybe this was the cure for the Texas recruiting slowness. I'll take it. I don't know if it is, but I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, it seems like uh, we got stuff to talk about, which is always great. Um, yeah, I mean, the the Broughton commitment was uh, an adventure. And, Jeff, you were with me for two days while I was, uh, I mean, what, literally taking a phone call every 10 minutes to try to get an update on it. Yeah, Mike was Mike was busier than a fruit merchant, man. He's got to he's run around, got to go where the action is. And it's, it's, if he's mid-interview with somebody and that phone rings, he's got to take it. But. Yeah, man, Mike, it it was 
I, it, it wasn't ever, to me anyway, and, and you're obviously closer to this than I am, it, it never seemed to me like it was a question of wavering on Texas. It just seemed like maybe timing and uh, some different things working out. But, man, for I don't you can't overstate how huge this is for, for Texas to get Vernon brought in the number 70 overall prospect in the 24-7 sports composite rankings. The nation's, uh, I think, is number six defensive tackle right now, the number 10 overall prospect in the state of Texas. Uh, again, Mike, took a while, but, man, this is, gosh, this is so huge for Texas. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talk about all the time how hard it is to find quality defensive linemen in the state, um, especially these four-eyed body types that can, uh, you know, play multiple positions that be that big and that move and, and move that well as he does. And a uh, former basketball player, you can really see that in his feet and his lateral movement and his quickness and everything. And um, just a kid who's really scratching the surface on his football ability right now. And a great kid and a great family, too. I mean, I, I hate to sound like uh, Mac Brown there, but uh, really is like one of the best families I've met during the process. And and one of the best kids. And you're right that it was never really a question about the selection. I think it was more, um, you know, they announced a commitment date. It was his birthday. Obviously, when you announce a commitment date, everybody tunes in. And then when you don't announce, people start calling you going, hey, when are you going to announce? So uh, I think they got a little overwhelmed maybe with uh, with phone calls and everything. And his mom decided to kind of slow things down, let him enjoy his birthday. And then, um, you know, I mentioned – that Vernon had originally told me it would be reannounced the 18th, which is uh, today, I guess, as we're recording this. Um, and then uh, right after that was told again that it would be next week or two. Um, I wrote on our board at the time that I think that that was kind of a ploy. Uh, there's a possibility that, that was a ploy to kind of throw everyone off the scent, get everybody to stop asking, and then be able to just drop the video. Right. Uh, and make it a surprise. And, you know, very little in recruiting is can be a surprise anymore. So I get that they wanted to have that moment and, um, and you know, have that surprise. But, yeah, just a, a fantastic get for Texas for Oscar Giles, who really needed a, a win like this with an elite guy. Uh, Craig Niver, the area recruiter, helped a lot in that recruitment. And as I said yesterday, a big, uh, big win for the class as well because that was a whole effort of, um, you know, I, at the opening, Jake Major's mom spending time with Vernon's mom and, and Hudson Card's mom spending time with her. And, uh, you know, Jake Major's and Logan Parr just basically sticking on Vernon's hip the entire time at that camp. So uh, a big win for the class. I heard Prince Dorba, actually, the newest commit uh, before Broaden was actually huge in the last week as well. So, Mike, there's a couple different angles I want to take on this. And let's start with the fact that, you know, I get asked all the time, like, kind of what what position do you value in recruiting? And I think it's finding, you know, offensive line has gotten to the point where, you know, you, you can project guys a little bit more. But I think if I impact defensive linemen, because whether it's been a, a Malcolm Brown or DeMarvin Leal or, or Vernon Broughton, I mean, you can't just go replace those guys. And when you talk about defensive line talent, that, that's where – you know, Texas, that's where you've got to get back to, not just to, to win the Big 12, but you start thinking about the playoff and competing with, you know, the Clemsons and the Alabamas of the world. Uh, you know, I looked at it, Mike, starting with the 2013 cycle through 2019. The state of Texas produced 55 four-star and five-star defensive linemen, according to the 24-7 Sports Composite Rankings. Of those 55, only 20 signed with Texas or another Big 12 school. And you've got guys in that mix for Texas that didn't pan out. You know, Derek Roberson transferred out, Chris Daniels transferred out, Jordan Elliott transferred out, Andrew Fitzgerald medically retired, Legarion Carson didn't qualify and technically didn't sign, uh, but he was one of those you know fifty five. But man, that it's just the fact that you can't go. If Texas missed on Vernon Broughton, you just can't go find another one of these guys. I don't think you could stress the importance of keeping the elite in-state talent in your conference, more importantly, on your roster, uh, because your backup plans are guys that, while they might be two or three years down the road, you've got something, it's still two or three years down the road. Yeah, I think a couple things there. I think that, A, if you want to compete with Alabama and Clemson and Ohio State at the national level, you're going to need those bodies, and, and obviously you know, people like Alabama were chasing Vernon Broughton. They felt they needed those bodies as well. 
Uh, the difference is that Alabama's got a little further reach to go get more bodies like that than Texas does. And um, So, yeah, you're right. You have to keep those guys when you can get them. And we've seen in the past when, um, you know, when they've had to make backup options, they're guys that we like. They're guys that I think we can project. I think that Texas generally does a good job of evaluating kind of hidden second options, but you're always playing with fire a little bit um, in that because you're you're projecting so far out right. and, and hoping that you can develop. So, I think to get a guy who the rating services already view as a guy who's, who's a higher impact uh, player it is obviously big. It's big for perception. And I think even just playing in the Big 12, if you're not going to be Oklahoma and have just an offense that's incredible, you've got to figure out what the market inefficiency is for you to win. And I think for Texas, that's to play great defense and to control the ball. Um, and, you know, I think that, Addy, and you know, Texas and Oklahoma are probably the only two schools in the Big 12 that have the ability to add a lot of guys like Vernon Broughton or Alfred right. Collins up yeah. front. So you've got to beat Oklahoma to those guys and be able to control what you can do defensively um, so that you can win your conference year and then you're out. Yeah, and to your point, I mean, you look at Oklahoma, uh, go back to the 2018 cycle, they get Ronnie Perkins, who I know they're expecting a lot from this year. You know, Neville Gallimore, if I remember right, was a – a pretty highly rated recruit. I know Ron Tatum was, but Ron Tatum, I, I guess he's not there anymore. I'm not really sure what the deal is with Ron Tatum. But, yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got to get those guys because, again, uh, you know, and like you said, Mike, I think you made a good point. You know, this staff has done a really good job of identifying guys. Uh, you know, Daniel Carson, I think, is going to be a guy that ends up being a, a, a good player for Texas. Uh, Peter Poggi, I think, is a guy that's got a chance to, to be a good player, um, you know, even going back to the Charlie Strong staff, like Gerald Wilbon, I think, has got a chance to, to by the time he's done in the next two years, be a guy that you say, okay, he had a pretty productive career. But, again, you know, when you get a war daddy like a, like a Malcolm Brown or back in the day like a, like a Frank Ocam uh, or a Corey Redding, um, it, just, it just completely changes just how you view that defensive line and, and, and just, it makes it easier to fill in everything around it but you know Mike with the running back situation we talked about that last week and that's been a hot topic and Stan Drayton's name has come up quite a bit but you mentioned Oscar Giles and this is a guy that when you talk to guys that played for him while they were at Texas uh, whether it's uh, you know a Jackson Jeffcoat or an Alex Okafor I mean they'll tell you to a man that they feel like he's a really good coach but uh, maybe hasn't always gotten it done on the recruiting trail but like you said with between Prince Dorba and and Vernon Broughton, that's two really big commitments for him in the last two weeks. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, I mean, if you go back and look at, at Giles' time under Mac Brown, he was absolutely getting it, getting it done on the recruiting front. Now, maybe that was more of a condition of the state of the program at the time um, and just the reputation he could recruit off of. But, you know, if, if he develops a couple of these guys, even a couple of the, you know, a guy like Moro Jomo and um, – and guys like that, you know, I think that obviously if Texas begins to win, his job gets a little easier. He starts landing those guys a lot more frequently. But, you know, Oscar's got the gr- a great reputation as a developer of talent. I think that he's um, generally a guy that people like. And, I, you know, I mentioned last week with Dorba, and I think the same thing that, you know, goes with Broughton is that there are some kids that just vibe with Giles. He's got just more of an off- authentic kind of pitch. It's not real flashy. It's – it's more, you know, he's an X's nose. He's a ball guy, and I think that that Broughton and his family kind of uh, built a really good relationship with Giles. There were some commonalities in there that of Giles that you know, I think he could almost see himself in in young Vernon, you know, a young version of him as well. So, um, yeah, just a great job by them. And I mean, there were times that it looked like Texas was was seriously slipping in this recruitment. I kept talking to sources, and, and one in particular kept telling me, regardless of what happens, he's going to end up at Texas. And so that's, you know, I just kind of stuck with that. So, Mike, let's look at this, the D-line picture as a whole, and let's take Prince Dorba out of that because I don't consider him, you know, in the D-line mix. We'll file him away and be back, or it's more of kind of a specialized position. But you got Vernon Broughton now. Uh, as we sit here and record this, we may have some news. Um, here in the next few hours, the way things are trending, so keep locked into the site for that. Uh, depending on when this podcast drops, uh, Alfred Collins is still out there, and we know that this is a class where the class size isn't going to be all that big. So, what do you kind of give me your thirty thousand foot view on how you think D line recruiting goes from here? 
Well, I think obviously getting Broughton gives you a, a huge boost because you're not you're not scrambling going, we've got to land one of these guys. We've got to do whatever we can, but we still have to fill our class. So, um, you know, I think at, at this point, all eyes right now are on Alfred Collins. I mean, that's the big fish out there for Texas. And, you know, with Collins, I think as much as highly as I think of Vernon Broughton, I think Collins actually may have a, a higher ceiling and be a better prospect in the end. Man, I think that lot. the two the two of them could be fantastic together. And, um, you know, they land Broughton and Collins. You're talking about a class that, uh, up front that Texas hasn't brought in under Tom Herman or even in a long time. So, you know, I think that it, it helps them taking a little bit of the pressure off in that way. Um, I think this is probably a three-man class. I think it could go to four if um, if they feel like they want to extend it to four. I think that, uh, you know, you mentioned a little bit of news going on right now. We are tracking uh, Utah defensive lineman Van Fillinger, um, who – who announced today on his Twitter that he was ready to make a decision. Our guy out in the, in the Utah area, the mountain regions for 24 seven Blair and Gulo um, said he's hearing very positive things for Texas. I checked in with uh, my sources on the, on the Texas side and, and heard some of the same things. So, um, you know, that could be another guy they add to the fold who is not going to have the rankings cachet of, of Broughton and Collins, but who I think is a extremely good prospect, um, probably more, technically refined than the other two probably more limited ceiling wise but but a lot more for a lot further along right now so um yeah i mean i think that you could see them take uh, a guy like Broughton, a guy like fillinger and then may you know everything's going to go all out for alfred collins at this point um and then you know they've still got a local guy like prince Liam and Milan, um who's still in state right. uh, and, and and at Maynard. And I think that, you know, if they wanted to go four and Princely wanted in, they, they could go that way. So, Mike, I don't want to go too far into the Van Fillinger rabbit hole, but is this uh, – you think this is a, a Jake Lange project? Jake Lange, obviously, on the support staff, uh, was big in, in Texas getting Junior Angelau a few years ago. Uh, is this an Oscar Giles thing? Is this just, hey, staff relies and we just like this kid a lot? Like, where do you think this – how do you think this all started? From what I was told, you know, Fillinger really recruited Texas more than anything, more than them recruited okay. them. Um, he does have a link on his, uh, his – one of his high school coaches played for Todd Orlando at Utah State. Well, there you go. Uh, so there is a link there. They do know somebody at the school. Uh, but Fillinger really re- kind of reached out to Texas and expressed interest. And I don't think Texas thought he was that serious at the beginning. And, um, you know, he came in for an unofficial in June, and they said, well, we'll we'll see if we can get him back. Well, then he came back two weeks later for uh, the heat wave. And, uh, you know, it seems like he he saw all he needed to saw. I spoke with him briefly after one of those visits, and he seemed pretty impressed by everything. Um, You know, besides that, growing up, you know, Michigan was really a dream school for him. And he kind of said so. Michigan has offered him, so I'm not sure what happened with the Wolverines in that race. But, um yeah, I think it's been a, a total project all the way around. I know that Jake Lange hosted him when he was on campus. I was actually at the camp where I saw uh, Jake driving him around on a golf cart. Uh, Derek Chang's been been heavily involved in this one, and he, he usually stays pretty silent when he's involved. Uh, and then Giles and, and Orlando as well. So, um, yeah, I think it's been a, a total team effort. Well, that, and again, we'll track that. I don't know exactly when this podcast is going to drop and when that news may or may not drop, but Van Fillinger's, uh, it's a name, Mike. Like you said, he's been on the periphery, but now it's its uh, based on all the intel. He's, uh, he's front and center. Mike, what else are you tracking right now, man? I know Jahari Rogers is now off the board, committed to Florida. So what are you in, you know, we're we're in that kind of slow period right now for recruiting. So what kind of give me something that, that's jumping out to you right now or that at least – is, is top of mind for you outside of the D-line stuff? Well, you know, I'll say this. Uh, the, the Fillinger stuff kind of came out of nowhere for me, and it was – I certainly knew who he was, um, certainly was watching him, but didn't know, A, that he would be deciding this quickly. And, B, you know, we kind of talked about those D-line numbers. I wasn't sure how things were going to shake out and, and what priority guys were going to be. And um, so, you know, he wasn't even – I you know, after every commitment I do a who's next top five – guys to commit type of thing and and Dillinger wasn't even on mine uh, for Broughton but um, you know I mean he could very well be the next guy on that list so uh, outside of that when you know when it comes to doing future who's next to commits you know there's not a lot of guys right now that I feel 
great with Texas about who are also deciding soon. Um, so I think that we're watching guys like Chad Lindbergh. You know, he's he's someone who I think is going to drop in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, I, th- I know his family really wants him to get his commitment out of the way before his summer practice schedule starts and, and to really be committed and, and, and get that out of his mind so he can focus on his senior year. Uh, Chris Thompson, of course, deciding on August 1st. So that's another one we're watching as well. But, um, you know, outside of those guys, I think that there's a chance for two or three more in the summer. And then uh, really we kind of shift to the fall where we see fall officials and, and a whole new, almost a whole new cycle starts. Right. So let's go ahead and get the other newsy item of the week. Rashad Samples leaving Texas, leaving his support staff role, taking a full-time gig at SMU. And that last check, that role had still not been completely decided. Uh, Mike, you've been covering this Dallas to Austin movement as, as well as anybody had, kind of twofold. I think everybody wants to know, number one, does this affect anybody that's in either the 2020 class or the 2021 class with Quay Davis? Uh, and two, kind of where does Texas go from here recruiting the Metroplex without Rashad Samples on the staff? Yeah, I haven't talked to Quay yet. Um, I should see him this weekend at the Prime 21 camp. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that for now everybody seems like uh, everything's good. People I talked to at Texas said they don't have a lot of worries about losing guys that they have, like Quinn and Jackson or or Quay or, or uh, Prince Dorba, who was also kind of part of that. But um, – Obviously, you know, it sucks to lose talented people, but that's kind of what happens when you hire right. talented people. Um, and, you know, Mac Brown used to talk about all the time that the measure of a coach was, you know, the way that their staff was, was hired away from them. And um, I think it speaks well for Herman developing talent. It's the second support staff member that's gone from Texas to SMU following Trey Haverty. Um, so I think that people look at, at that staff and they say, you know, there's something there that we like, there's something there that we want. Um, obviously samples is a rising star in this, in this business. Um, a guy that in a few years, I wouldn't be surprised to see in a big power five role and one of the best recruiters in the country. Um, Texas, look, I think that I've seen a lot of comments about why didn't Texas try to keep him. There's nothing you can do if you're a, a support staff role guy and you get offered a full-time role on the field being able to recruit. For that career, unless Texas had an opening that they could give him, there was really nothing they could do. And I think that obviously there were no bitter endings. If you saw the the Twitter interactions between Samples and most of the coaching staff, I think everybody was really excited and really happy for him. And, um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me that if there's an opening down the road to see Samples return to Texas, I think that – you know, he's a guy that Tom Herman values. He's a guy that Derek Chang values. And obviously he loved his time in Austin. So how do you replace it? I don't know if you totally can, but the other thing is, look, Samples was really good at what he did. He obviously had connections through his father at Duncanville, but in the end, I mean, he was an on-campus recruiter. He wasn't a guy that he didn't have the same impact as a guy who could go out on the road um, and really do a lot of, of the heavy, heavy lifting and recruiting. So, I think one of the biggest things is if Texas can figure out a resolution to David Bay, or I guess not Texas, but if David Beatty can figure out a resolution yeah. to his his deal with Kansas, and, and obviously if that rumor comes through and he's hired by Texas, I think that that's a guy that you can look at to kind of fit into that role. He gives you an upgrade at, at what Samples probably did when it came to game planning and X's and O's and wide receiver instruction. And is also a guy who's recruited Dallas very well in the past, a former uh, high school coach in my hometown of Irving, and, uh, you know, a guy that has a lot a lot of connections in the state. So I think that, that mitigates it a little bit. But, you know, Texas is going to continue to find talented guys. Um, you know, you, you see it just all the time. They bring on uh, – they just seem to find guys. Uh, the I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but the quarterback from LSU that they recently hired. Oh, yeah, Brendan uh, Harris. Brandon Harris, I mean, that could be a guy that, again, you, you're talking about young guys who have played college football recently and can kind of relate to kids on, on recruitment because they've been through it. You know, I think Brandon Harris can be a guy like that. So um, maybe not in Dallas specifically. Right. But I think, I, you know, I think, it, I think it's just great all the way around. I think that obviously it, it – it hurts for Texas short term, but it's great for Herman and, and the view of him and, and the people he hires. It's great for Samples and his future career, and I think that Texas will be able to move on. Right. 
Hey, you, you know, Mike, we didn't talk about this on the air, and I don't know if you and I have ever talked about this topic. I think we have a little bit. But, you know, I'm interested to know from your just, just kind of you following us on the day-to-day, what does Tom Herman allow his – and I know coaches are restricted in terms of the times of year they can be on the road, but the involvement of Tim Beck and Todd Orlando in recruiting. Because I know, like, Mac Brown back in the day – didn't want his assistants doing a ton of recruiting on the road, wanted them kind of more to stay local uh, and really kind of go out national or in-state whenever you really need to go get a guy. Is that kind of how Tom Herman approaches it with Tim Beck? Because I know, like, Tim Beck, he's big in Arizona. He's big in Southern California. Uh, Todd Orlando's big in Southern California. And we talked about, you know, the Van Fillinger stuff. Kind of just from what you've seen, heard, observed, learned, whatever, uh, how do you feel like the the the, the two primary coordinators are just in terms of what they're asked to do or allowed to do on the road? I think that um, if you just look at their personalities, Beck is one of the better recruiters on staff. Right. I don't think Orlando cares about recruiting at all, to be <laughs> honest. I mean, I think he understands he needs it, but right. I think he'd also like to sit in a dark room and draw up blitz packages that were up to him. Um, so I think that you kind of see that reflected both guys, you know, they do their share. They go out, they evaluate all those things. But Beck is is a lot more visible. Um, obviously, as a former high school coach, he, he makes a lot of the rounds in Texas. He makes a lot of the rounds in Arizona. And basically with any quarterback, Beck is the one that's directly involved, regardless of what region they're in. Right. So I think that Her- Herman understands that Beck is one of his best weapons as a recruiter. And uh, he utilizes him in that way where he understands that, you know, while Orlando can um, can give out, you know, the evaluations he wants. And I've heard that, that uh, Todd is the stingiest guy on staff when it comes to giving out offers, especially a linebacker. Um, right. He really wants to see something specific in a guy before he's ready to offer. Um, I think that you kind of see that bear out, whereas he uses his, his better weapon in back a lot. And he, he allows Orlando to do his work. Um, but, you know, it's, it's maybe not as big of a point of emphasis for him. I got you. Mike, before we uh before we wrap this up, man, we'll do a little bit of team. You were at Big Twelve Media Days, as I said, busier than the fruit merchant, just trying to you know get everything done you needed to get done. And uh, I, for those that are unaware, I gave Mike the an enviable task of posting up at Sam Ellinger's media scrum, where there were just an insane amount of people wanting to get something from Sam Ellinger. So. Just give me a couple takeaways, Mike. What do you think about being uh, kind of posted up in the the Sam? Uh, I don't even know what you want to call that the uh, the Sam Scrum, and then just anything else you you picked up that kind of caught your eye at uh, media days. I have um, intense, intense claustrophobia, and that was a challenge during. The, I'm sorry. Yes, and the session. <laughs> no, I mean it was great. Like, but I went. You know, I went an hour ahead of time. Yeah, I went. To- one hour ahead of time and just stood there because you could see when we walked in that day, the TV guys had already set up their camera podiums. Um, it was going to be a circus. And yeah, I'm sitting there eating lunch and Mike's like, I'm gonna go stand over there. I'm like, dude, it's one thirty. Like you don't have to go right now, but now Mike grabbed the recorder and a notepad and went on his way. Sounds like you're at AC. Aren't you glad I did though? I mean, I was uh, yeah. in prime position. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, I haven't done many media days. I've done two, I think. Have you ever seen, I mean, is it, was that like a abnormally large group for Sam or for a, have you ever seen a group that big for or? a player? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I can think of, I want to say probably like Charlie Strong's first media days. I, I think there was a pretty sizable crowd in front of him, um, but man, for a player off the top of my head, I, I can't remember one. Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty insane. Um, you know, I think Sam is is a pro at when it comes to talking. I think that he understands. He knew what everyone was coming to ask him. We joked about it before he got there that who's going to ask the first Baker Mayfield question and and things like that. And he, you know, he deflected just about everything pretty deftly. You know, he he talked a lot about shutting out the noise and, um, you know, being a good team player for his, his team. And it's not about him. It's about the team. And, uh, he does it all, but he doesn't come off in a way where he sounds like he's, he's telling you empty things. Uh, you know, he's very thoughtful in the way he answers questions. He's a smart kid. And I think that that comes off. Um, you know, it's weird to me that Sam is has this degree of unlikability, I guess, in the nation. Um, 
although I, I understand when you're the Texas quarterback, regardless of who you are, you're, you're, you know, you're unliked by a lot of people. Right. So uh, the biggest thing that, that I took away from it was how hard it is to be the Texas quarterback. It's one of the hardest jobs in, in college sports, I would assume. And uh, the other things I took away was just listening to Sam talk about other guys, other players on the team. You know, it sounds like the hype around Jake Smith is very real. Yeah. Um, when you hear, when you hear guys talk about him and, and kind of do it in a wide eyed way of man, imagine what this guy can do. Uh, Jordan Whittington, another guy, the thing that actually really stood out to me from Sam is how many times that he said, guys, Keontae Ingram is going to be a huge factor this year. Um, you know, I mean, that's a guy we know. And usually we go into those things like, hey, tell us about the freshman or tell us about a guy that we may not know that much about. Obviously, we all know about Keontae Ingram, but Sam went out of his way multiple times to mention that Keontae Ingram was going to be a huge factor yeah. uh, this year with the team. And, and I think that that's encouraging for Texas. Yeah, I remember he was at the uh, quarterback retreat, uh, the Steve Clarkson deal this summer, and Tom Loy caught up with him and did a video interview. And Sam kind of gave it, well, you know, there's a lot of guys in NL, but hey, Keontae is going to be really good. So, yeah, that's a good, good catch on your part, Mike. Uh, folks, you can get him on Twitter, at MikeRoach247. Uh, he's always posting good stuff there, but obviously at Horns247, you get him there. Mike, anything else you want to add before we shut it down this week? Uh, you know, hopefully – uh, Texas can keep this momentum going. It makes my job a lot more fun. Um, somebody actually had a comment on the Broughton thread that was like, see, Mike, now you and Giles are good at your jobs because this kid committed. And it was, <laughs> you know, it was a tongue in cheek, obviously, but right. um, that's kind of how it goes. So I kind of, for some reason, bear the responsibility when Texas isn't recruiting well. Um, so I like it much better when they are recruiting well, but on the other hand, I do understand that I really have nothing to do with that. And so you know, my, my goal is just to try to give you the best stuff possible. So um, I'm really proud of the way we reported the Broughton story. I think that we were one of the few sites that really kind of stuck to our guns and, and didn't ride the waves with it and, and held tight to our information. Uh, sometimes that works for you. Sometimes it doesn't. I, you know, I've held tight to my information before and, uh, and seen it gone bad on me. But I think in this case, um, you know, we did a great job. And I'm, I'm proud of, uh, the, you know, the way we covered it and the way the whole team handled it. Nope. You're the man, Mike. Mike Roach, Horns 24-7 recruiting editor. Mike will do it again next week, man. All right. Thanks, boys. All right. Big thanks to Mike. Big thanks to Travis, the best day of videographer in the podcast game. Matt, thanks for everything, man. You are more than welcome. Rod B., appreciate the time and the knowledge. Anytime, brother. Anytime. For everybody here on Longhorn Blitz, for everybody at the Austin Radio Network and the Horn 104.9, 1019 AM, 1260, streaming on the Horn app at hornfm.com, where you can get Rod B., on the broadcast each and every weekday from 1 to 3. Shameless plug. You can get Longhorn Blitz on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, anywhere you get your podcasts. And thanks to Matt, you can go to our archives, classic interviews, all that stuff on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. Don't forget, people, thank you so much, those of you who have left reviews, who have rated us, all that stuff. Thank you so much. Keep doing that. That's how we keep this show on the air. That's good feedback. So please, thank you so much for listening and uh, keep doing that. And with that, we will see you again on another episode of Longhorn Blitz. Thank you so much for downloading and listening. And we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.